All right, thanks. All right, I th it's about 6 o'clock, so unless y'all just want to wait for a while and look at me stand here. No, Alan doesn't want that. Ready for a little swing lose? Not ready for that either. Wow. This morning, uh, I, th this morning's message did not get written until Saturday, yesterday morning. The one that I'm giving you now was written for last Sunday night. This was not written in response to what happened, but I rewrote it, I reread it this afternoon, and it is a response to what happened. God gave me a message last Sunday, actually the week before, for what was going to happen on Wednesday. I mean, it's just that when I see these things lining up, how can you doubt God's not in control? I mean, I doubt myself sometimes that I know what God wants me to do, but then when things fall into place, it's like, I'm in charge, just relax. But every day, people face hardships. They face many, many hardships. And God made a good creation. God made a creation that he called good. So you wonder why there's so much suffering in the world. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that these words fall upon receptive hearts, that our spirit be in tune with yours, Father, as we try to understand the mysteries that we're dealing with every day and strengthen our faith, our love, and our care for one another. In Jesus' name, amen. We live in a world where there's answers. For those of you that are computer literate, we have a thing called Google. You can Google anything. If you have a question, you put it in Google, you hit the question mark, and they give you the answer. You can get a million answers in seconds. We live in a world where no questions go unanswered. If you want to know why that light's shining, if you want to know how to build something, uh, if you want to know anything, you can Google it, and it will tell you. If that's a little too inconvenient, after all, it's a big old computer, I can get on my smartphone right here. I can Google that. That has more computer in it than the ships that went to the moon. This thing will compute more, operate more, and has more computing power than the ships that went to the moon. If they'd have had that, that's all they'd have needed for a computer. I can Google on that. All kinds of search engines. But there's a problem with that. Oh, it's nice when you've got a question, but there's a problem with it. We're now conditioned to expect answers for every problem. You can't Google God's response. You can't Google moral answers. You can't Google faith. You have to stand on that. That's not an item that mankind can answer for you. There's some questions that there's just not going to be a good answer for. I don't care how often you look, how hard you pray, how deep your faith is, there's just not going to be a good answer to some questions. question today is, remember, this was written almost two weeks ago. Why is there suffering and evil? That's the question. It's not a new one. Mankind's been asking that since Adam and Eve. I'm almost sure Eve went to Cain, or he went to Adam, and, and asked why Cain had to murder the, their other son, Abel. I'm almost sure. It had to devastate them. You know, they were human in every way like we are. The loss of one son at the hands of another had to be devastating. Then we get a story in John, John 9, 1 through 7. And it says, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples, disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so the works of God might be displayed in him. 
As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, put it on man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. And this word means sent. So the man went and washed and come home seeing. That's a great story. You know, man blind since birth. Notice that Jesus usually healed in different ways. He didn't have one method of healing. But the question asked by the disciples, Rabbi, who sinned so that the man was born blind? They were really asking, why is this man suffering? What caused this? How come he's blind? They wanted the answer to that. Well, when I see a blind person, I ask the question, when I see a baby born with defects, I ask that question. When I see somebody that has to struggle, uh, my own dear wife had polio. She has had to struggle all of her life. She was in an iron lung in the 50s. I asked, why? Why has she had to struggle so hard? That's what they were asking. Why was this man suffering? Jesus doesn't really give them a direct answer. He doesn't give them the answer to their question. I think maybe it's because there's not really a good answer to give. There's suffering, there's evil, there's death, there's destruction in this world because of sin, because we fell from the grace. We fell from our relationship with God. But we do seek more knowledge on this. We do seek to know more and understand more of why. So, I really think we need to look at why are we asking this question to begin with? Why are we asking why? Usually when you approach a problem, you've got to figure out what it is you're trying to figure out. So my question is, why are we asking why? For the answer to that question, we've got to go back to the very beginning of creation. Genesis tells us that God created the universe, and each part of it, God called it good. Every time he made something, the light, the seas, the land, the plants, the vegetation, the animals, creatures, humans. Every time he created them, he called it good. But yet, each one of these good things can cause immense harm. They can be bad. God called them good. But the light, if you stay out on it too long, you'll be burned by it, get skin cancer, get too close to it, it'll burn you up. The seas, man, you got, you got tsunamis, you got all the deep water, the oceans, you got the rough water, you got ships that sink. The land, earthquakes. Terry said we had, what, two yesterday? Earthquakes. Land opens up. There's cases in Florida where the land opens up and just swallows homes. The land. The plants, vegetation. There's poisonous plants, poisonous vegetation, vegetation that will kill you. Animals. How many dangerous animals are out there? Almost all of them in one way or another. And humans. Humans he called good. But I think when we're asking this question of why, we're not seeing a lot of the good. But God called them good. Now here's where we get in, I think, to why the disciples ask who sinned. Throughout history, God followers have looked at the story of the good creation. We've leaned upon our faith of a good God. But that faith cannot be reconciled with the fact that there's a great deal of bad in the world. We've got this dilemma. We've got a good God, a loving God, a God that says it's good, and then we see over here the evidence of bad. How do we reconcile that? How do we make it fit together? So that's why we ask why. A long time, humanity pretty much had it figured out. They had a straightforward answer. Basically, they said that suffering happened because God was punishing the person or the group of people for a specific reason. It began with Adam and Eve. They were the first humans who sinned. They defied God's instructions. 
They were forbidden to eat from the fruit in the garden, from one fruit in the Garden of Eden. That sin broke the relationship with humanity and God and subjected us to temptation, to sin, and it's called the original sin. We were removed from the Garden of Eden. Adam had to go from being a gardener to a farmer. And there's a whole lot of difference in being a gardener and a farmer. But that's what he had to do because of sin, the original sin. The relationship was broke. Well, we see this sort of cause and effect relationship between humans throughout early history. The human sin, humans defy God's laws and mandates. God punishes the humans. God sent 10 plagues upon the Egyptians. Why? The Pharaoh would not release the Israelites. So he punished them. When the Israelites didn't trust God and build idols in the wilderness, God made them wait and wander for 40 years. You sin, God punish. Seems pretty simple. It answers the question of why. If you sin against God, God is going to punish you. Humanity, that was their answer, and they were happy and they were content with it. Actually, it's a, not a bad answer. They were exiled to Babylon because they had not been following God's command. Israelite got punished a lot for disobeying God's law. And for thousands of years, that's how it went. Many earthquakes, every disease, every disaster, humans explained away as God responding to sin of the people. Over time, things have happened to make that simple response a little inadequate. For one, Christ has come. He, being God, took on the form of man. And in his own suffering, his death, we could see God's love for us is beyond anything we could imagine. Love for all people. God's desire to save us, not to harm us, not to hurt us. So that's the one thing that we've seen by the revelation of Christ when he came. We've seen God's love for what it was, not as a punisher, not as a, a master who would beat us if we disobeyed, but as a loving father who loved us. Secondly, science has taught us a lot about the natural world. With that knowledge, it doesn't make sense to point to every natural disaster and say it's God's way of punishing humanity. There are some people that still look at that. The Texas floods, when they happened, people were talking about God punishing Texas. Uh, California, when they have an earthquake, God's punishing that. When, when New Orleans about sunk into the sea, God was, you'd hear all this and you'd see preachers on TV speaking about how the people are paying the price for their sin. It might be. But I think New Orleans, when you build it underneath the sea level, is going to get flooded. I think in Texas, when you live there where it's at, you're going to get all those, those uh, waters that come in and going to get all those floods and tsunamis. I think California, with all that earthquakes and all those, that geographic area that you shouldn't live on, it's going to collapse and you're going to have earthquakes. I think I pretty much understand why these natural disasters happen. Forest fires, they happen. That's probably more of a concern to us here than it is some of these other things happening. But forest fires start a lot of times because somebody does something dumb. Like it's a dry, no burn season. Somebody goes out there to burn their leaves and they burn down the forest. Well, that happens. Lightning sets it off too. So there could be a natural lightning cause or it could be a human cause. They often spread rapidly burn forests, vegetables, animals, homes. They kill people. They cause immense destruction. But they also cleanse the ecology. They restore a balance to the system. The wildlife that returns and the, the growth that comes in after that is usually more healthy and beautiful than what was burned away. When they come from the ashes, it's usually better. Farmers sometimes burn off their fields for that same results. They burn away the old. So we have a knowledge that some of the suffering is a result of natural disasters. It's not God punishing us. It's just part of the natural order of things. 
These disasters don't make God's creation or even God less good. They don't point to God as being less good. A lot of times they're unfortunate, they're heartbreaking, but they're the byproduct of creation balancing and keeping healthy. What we consider disasters is just the earth doing what the earth does. The tectonic plates have always shifted. Continents have always moved. Mountains have come up and went down. We just don't live long enough to see that process, except for the very few instances when the earth rumbles and we're there, or the forest fire happens. It doesn't explain all the suffering of human beings, but it helps give us an ideal that not all things are because of evil. It's not all things are caused because of Satan. Not all things are done because we've sinned. But there is a question of evil. Nearly every day, the news is filled with war, genocide, and terrorist attack. It's causing innocents to suffer. I told you it was written two weeks ago. Couldn't be more right on than what we dealt with this week. So why doesn't God, who is all-powerful, prevent such evil? It's a good question. Why doesn't God stop people from doing evil things? He could have stopped that 19-year-old kid from going in there and killing those 17 kids. He could have stopped them. He could stop all the carnage in the world. He could stop everything that is happening is going to happen. But when I read in Revelation, I see that the world is going to go through such destruction that if he didn't end the time soon, everybody would die. So God's not going to end the destruction. Part of the reason that God doesn't end the evil is we have to consider that we have free will. Going back again to creation, we were created in God's image. But we were created with the freedom to choose between good and evil. When we took upon the knowledge of good and evil and disobeyed God, that was the sin that brought us into this broken world. God could have created us so we'd always choose good. He could have created Eve where she would have told Satan no. Could have created Adam where he told Eve no. He could have done that. God gave him free will. If he gave us and programmed us to always do what's good, we'd be more robots than children. If you had the power, or if I had the power with mine, to program my children to respond just the way I want them to respond every single time, I wouldn't do it. I don't think you would do that. We would not want anybody being a robot, being blindly doing what we tell them to do. God didn't want that either, so he gave us free will. If we were programmed for this, any devotion or faithfulness that we would have towards God would be hollow, would not be real. It would be mandated. He gave the angels free will. A third of them broke away, even seeing heaven. I find that hard to understand. I find it hard to believe. That's how great sin is. That's how great evil is. Took a third of the angels and swept them out of heaven. Every one by their own choice. So God's given us the freedom to make these choices. When Joshua was asked, he says, choose, who you will, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When you and I said that's our choice, we will serve the Lord, we'll obey the Lord, we will love the Lord, we will fail the Lord, but we will love the Lord, that's the choice that God wants us to make. But he didn't force us to make it. He didn't compel us to make it. He simply offered himself there and says, here I am. God wants us to make that choice, but he will not force that. 
and he won't force it on the evil. If he stopped every evil act, that would be God imposing his will. Now, one day, Christ will return. One day, evil will be swept away. One day. It's not today. Well, it could be, but it's not today yet. We have the choice to act against God, even when our intentions are evil, harmful, even when they cause great suffering. We have the ability to make that choice. God has infinite power and wisdom, and he chose that for humanity. Knowing that, since God knew everything from before creation to the end, knowing that it was going to be some pretty nasty things that happened. He knew about the 17 before mankind even existed. He knew about the, the millions, quite frankly, that are going to follow. He knew about the carnage that has and is coming. God does not want us to suffer, whether by our own doings or any other reason. God wants what's good for us, even when we make bad choices. I talked this morning about that young, disturbed guy, a 19-year-old that killed 17 people. God loves him as much as God loves me. God loves him as much as God loves you. My prayer is that he seek forgiveness. I'd like to spend eternity with that young man. I pray that each of the 17 were saved. That's hard. My natural inclination is to want to go to the cell and beat him to death. But Christ in me says I love him. When I follow Christ in me, I'm following what God would have for me by my own free will. Didn't say it was easy. God never said you're going to have to like it. God says, here's what I require of my children, that ye love one another. He did not add any adjectives on there to tell us which one another, that ye love one another. Suffering is horrible, but it also provides an opportunity for God's grace to be at work. I don't know how many of those young kids in that high school and other kids around the country will be saved because of the witness of those that died. I don't know how many will be saved because they look at and see what's possible and what has happened and they make the decision that they need to have the Lord. I don't know how many, but I promise you there are people being saved because of this incident. I promise you that there are people that are going to be in eternity because these 17 were sacrificed. It's God's grace we need to lean up, lean on when we have our suffering. When we face illness or disease and death, these are terrible. Little Jackson this morning talking about, I'm not sure of the relationship, but the, the one he loves with the thing on his neck, you know, and, and he's suffering for that. He's worried about that. I'm worried about it too, because he is. You know, when we look at kids, some of the ones from the high school now are wanting to go on a national march, demanding changes in law. These kids are hurting and they're afraid. And instead of comforting them, we have politicians that use them. Instead of offering them God's peace, we offer them tribulation. We're an evil humanity. We're a cruel humanity. Christians have to stay in the gap. We have to do what we do in love. Not hate, not vengeance, but in love. Let's look at John again. This is where the story about the blind man, but did you notice there was something unusual about this blind, blind man, been blind since birth? Almost all the other people that were healed, raised from the dead, either sought out Jesus or somebody else sought out Jesus for them. Almost every other one of them asked for a healing. 
The blind man does not approach Jesus. He did not seek healing. He was noticed as they walked by. He was simply there, and as they walked by, they noticed the blind man. The disciples seen that he had been blind his whole life, and they reverted to this common explanation about the original sin. But the disciples wanted to know, since this man had been blind, whether it's his parents or his own sin that did it. I don't even think they were particularly interested in healing the man. I think what they wanted to do was, as they walked by, Rabbi, what about this? What caused this? I think they were just probably a casual conversation as they come by. I don't think it was a serious thing to bring God's power into the picture. Jesus' answer is not specific. He did say, this happened so that God's mighty works might dis be displayed in him, Jesus told his disciples. But here's something important to understand. God did not cause the suffering and the harm so that he could fly in like a superhero. He doesn't do that. He doesn't fly in at the last moment to save the day. That's not God. That's not what God does. Life happens. We make poor choices. Natural disasters hit. Our bodies fail us. There are people that are born with genetic defects. In a perfect world, they wouldn't be. We live in an imperfect world. But God does not wish harm for us. He does not want us to be sick, hungry, or lonely. Such an ideal is completely contrary to everything biblical about God's love. God desires good for us. He tells us that over and over again. God loves us and God wants to save us so much that he sent Jesus Christ to die the most agonizing death you could ever die. And then we doubt God's love. Well, why doesn't he do this? Why don't he do God did more than we ever had any right to ask for. But it's in the midst of the suffering that I think we can find hope. It's when the, we're in the middle of the worst times that we can see that God is still working good. It's taken me a little bit of time this week to work through my anger, my disgust, maybe even a little bit of rage, to understand that God works good, that many people will be saved. Many people will be witnessed to by the acts that happened that day. God works everything for good. Even if we don't see it, even if I don't know the numbers that are, are saved by it, even if I can't see the direct results, God works everything for good. This man who'd been suffering from blindness for many years, but it wasn't because of his sin or his parents. No one evil had harmed him, had blinded him. Without giving us the answer to the cause, Jesus healed the man so that all of the disciples could see it, could see that God doesn't leave us alone, suffering, even when we don't ask. That's the part I find most staggering about this story. The man did not seek. He was not like the woman with the blood issue who reached out and touched a garment. He was not like... Jairus, who sent for, for uh, Christ to heal his daughter. It was not like any of the others. It was not like Lazarus when the sister sent for Jesus. It wasn't like when they lowered a crippled man down through the roof of that house so that he could be healed. This man did nothing to ask for healing. But he was healed. God is with us. God works good, even in the midst of bad. I can't imagine living in a world without such promise and without such hope, without such faith in a good God. So why is there tragedy? Why is there suffering? Why is there evil? Questions many of us have had. Probably asked God in one way or another. But I've got to tell you, I'd rather live in a world with hope than a world of fear. I'd rather live in a world that has the promise of God than the one that has no promise of God. 
especially in a world like ours, where it's evil and suffering, a big part of our existence. Big part. Each one of us are in here have lost people that we love dearly. Until it's our time to go, we'll lose more people that we love dearly. There will be many tragic events happen that we'll be witness to or maybe even a part of. But we have the promise of God. With that promise comes the possibility, the meaning of purpose, of hope. Even in the midst of suffering and tragedy, there's hope. We're still left with the question, but at least we have faith in the promise of a good God. In the midst of the tragedy and suffering, we can always, always have hope for a better day with God. Sometimes we get questions from friends and family. And they'll usually say something, Now, Bob, don't go on and on about this. I just need to know this. And they want a specific answer, and they want it rather short. Because they know I have a tendency to go on. They don't want it complicated. But sometimes they'll ask something, if God is so good, how come there's so much bad in the world? I've been asked that, several different versions of it. I usually tell them, that's a tough question and no straight answer. But I know that God is loving and works for good in all situations. That's the best answer I can give them. If it's the closest one in the world that I love, or somebody that I barely know that asks me that question, that's the answer I have to give them. Because there is no straightforward answer to why some people suffer. There is none. But I know that God works for good in all situations. In the hardest times of my life, and I've had some, I've experienced God's love in so many ways that it's helped me through. There's suffering and evil, but I know God is a God that works for good. I'm a Christian because I want to be part of God's good work. Living as a Christian will not keep you from all harm, and in some circumstances will bring you into harm. But if you live a life that is thankful, thankful to God, that harm will not hurt you, even with your death. You're alive forevermore in Christ. You can't be hurt. You're not subject to the second death, the permanent death. The lost are. You will face a physical death. We all do. We do not face the second death. Death has no fear for me. I pray that those 17 were saved. I pray that they just experienced the first death, not the second. I pray that all these youth that are clamoring for something to be done, get the answer that they need. I pray that we as adults, administrators, lawmakers, governing officials, pastors, are able to reach out, bring peace, but bring peace that also brings safety and security. There are many things that God would have us do. I talked this morning about putting on the full armor of God. We have to do that. We are expected to stand up to evil. We're not expected to flee from it because the armor is all frontal. If you ever notice when the armor they describe it, it's all frontal. You got nothing on your back. If you run, you're wide open. God didn't mean for us to run. God means for us to stand up, and he says evil will flee. We stand up to evil. We don't run from it. We're not afraid of it. We stand up to it doesn't mean we're bold and cocky. It just means that we're not afraid of it. Well, we have to share that. We have to bring that to our community and our nation. Jesus talked about while there's light, we have work to do because the night's coming when no man can work. We have to do harder. Friends, we have to do more. I know you get tired of hearing me say this, but we need to be better witnesses. We need to be better witnesses to our neighbors, our relatives, our friends. We need to be better witnesses to each other. 
I got a little cranky in Sunday school this morning. And I felt bad about that all day. We can't be cranky with one another. We have to be loving. God does not give us a spirit of meanness. God gives us a spirit of love. Any meanness that we have does not come from God. So I ask that we pray, pray often, that we seek to know God's will, and that we understand that bad things happen to good people. And sometimes the only response we can do is hug them, love them, comfort them, pray with them, and share God's peace with them. For there's just no other answer that we can give. I found sometimes when I'm dealing with somebody that's in deep grieving, I've sat and held a hand, not said a word, and it seemed to be better. Sometimes that's all we need is to have the presence of another person, another person who loves God. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that your words dwell in the hearts. I thank you for the ones that have come tonight. I thank you for their love. I thank you for their witness. I thank you for their faith. I ask, Father, now that you magnify that love by ten times, that faith by ten times. I ask that you magnify each of the folks that are here tonight and me by ten times, Father. You give us ten times more so that we can go out and do ten times more. I pray that we witness to people. We give us opportunities to witness. You let people find us that need to be witnessed too, Father, and let us speak with, with authority your word. Let us speak with assurance of your love. Let us speak with the care that you have for us, Father. Again, we pray for the families that are suffering tonight, the many that are having to bury their young this week, the many that are grieving now and words can't console. I pray somebody's standing there holding their hand. I pray that they're getting comfort. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit comfort each of them. I pray your comfort and your care upon our local schools, Father. I pray you protect our local schools. I pray you protect the children here, Father, the teachers here, the administrators, Father. I pray you protect our families, Father. Many of us have families in these schools, and I pray that you just protect these schools from the evil. I pray this in Jesus' name, his holy and mighty name. Amen. Thank you all.